Man, it's good to see each one of you here today in the Lord's house, and we always begin our time together with a verse of scripture and spending some time uh, preparing our hearts for worship. <clears throat> Psalm 130, verse 1 through 4. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? None of us. <laughs> but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. A great promise, isn't it? Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and you prepare your heart for worship today. Confess your sins to the Lord and prepare yourself today for what God has for us in this time together today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer.
Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, you are worthy to be praised and glorified and honored. And Lord, we're gathered here today in this place to worship and glorify and honor you and you alone. I'm so thankful today for Jesus and for the hope that we have through Christ and the gospel. And Lord, I thank you so much that you came to this earth and you lived and died and rose again. And Lord, the gospel is our hope. And Father, we pray that you would bless this day and all that takes place. Bless as we lift up our voice in song and as your word is proclaimed, I pray, Lord, that it would go forth in power and in might. God, save the sinner today. God, encourage us in your word. Lord, may we live for your glory and for your honor. May we advance your kingdom on this earth so that every Man, woman, boy, and girl will hear the story of Jesus and the hope that we have through you. So, Lord, we lift up all the needs that are represented in our congregation today, knowing, God, that you can meet each need. And we pray for those that are sick and those, Lord, that need a touch from heaven. And I pray, God, your will would be done in each life and in each heart and each family. Lord, we love you today and we praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. So before we have our Lottie Moon um, emphasis and end gathering this morning, I want to introduce the gentleman who is going to be doing our video. His name is um, Keith Flanagan and his wife, Hannah. They are from this area originally. Keith's dad is Jimmy Flanagan and he was pastor at um, Mount Calvary for several years um, quite a bit ago, but some of y'all may remember Mr. Jimmy, but Keith, we had the privilege of meeting as we attended um, Power Life Youth Camp for several years. Keith attended camp. He was their um, athletic director for a while with the games and things, and later on in Keith's life, he realized after attending Power Life and being in their ministries that he thought he was saved, but he was not, and the Lord convicted him that he needed to get his life right. And the last year we attended um, youth camp in Kalakwa for Power Life, Keith was baptized at um, the service there at, after the evening service in the pool. And so we got to enjoy that. Well, then last year we had the privilege of having Keith as one of our speakers at youth camp for our church at Epworth. And he has, him and his wife, Anna, were such a blessing. They hung around and um, talked with us for a while and shared their vision of what they wanted to do, but they have moved to Montana. The Lord called them there to do a church plant. And um, so I wanted you to see this video that Keith shared and sent to us because he's just thanking us for um, giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering because they are a part of the North American Mission Board and what we do and what we give supports them in being able to do what God has called them to do. They gave up their life here. Um, Keith's mom has health problems and she can't fly, so she's she can't she's unable to visit them. So they have no family where they're at. So they left everything they knew, even though they're still in the United States. They had no people when they left here, so um, they they really sacrificed to um, do what God had called them to do. So I pray this morning, as you watch this video and as you give, that you think about Keith and Hannah. And you think about what you're given and how that goes to support them doing what God has called them to do. And their, um, oh, Lord, my mind just went blank. It happens. It does, don't it? <laughs> it happens to me all the time. Their obedience. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> to support their obedience to Christ because that is our ultimate calling is to do what he's called us to do. And right. obedient, be obedient when he calls us. So I pray that as you give this morning, if you already had your number in mind and the Lord's moving for you to give more, I pray that you do that so that you can continue to support Keith and Hannah and others from our area that are also part of the North American Mission Board. Hey guys, my name is Keith Flanagan and my wife and I are church planners here in Montana. I wanna thank you personally for every dollar you give to the cooperative program and to things like the Annie Armstrong offering. Every month, my wife and I receive a stipend that helps us live, helps us do community outreach as we seek to build a team and plant a church here in Montana. And if it wasn't for your faithfulness and your generosity, uh, I don't know what we would do. And so I wanna thank you so much 
for uh, the friendship your church has already been to us and for every dollar that you give that helps us do what we do here in Montana for the gospel. You guys have a great Sunday. Just stand as we sing. Lord, I lift your name on high.
You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. 
seated as we continue to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone.
Good morning. morning. Y'all, I'm shaking like a leaf on a tree. You just can't see it, but uh, I won't sing anyway. It's one of my favorite songs by Michael Combs. Their heads were low And their steps were slow As they walked along that long Emmaus road And a man appeared And as he drew near He said, why are you so sad? Are things really that bad? And they said, Sir, have you not heard? Or you must be a stranger in this town. For the one who came in the Father's name He has been cut down They laid his body in the ground In talk he began to explain About this Jesus And why he came He opened the scriptures And began to teach The preacher of preachers He began to preach In the wilderness the children had nothing there to eat A manna from heaven fell down at their feet When they were dry and thirsty in a foreign land Living water came forth out of a rock in the sand When the three children were thrown into flames A fourth man appeared, they even called him by name The manna and the water and the man they're all the same If you're still confused, let me say this real plain. It was me. It was me. It was me. It was me. I'm the one you left back there at Calvary. It was me. stars in the sky and who do you think made the day and the night who made the flowers and who made the trees and who made the sun and the moon and the seas who gives life to all who believe and who do you think made the blind and the sea and who made the very air that you breathe and who defeated death and won the Story. It was me. It was me. It was me. I'm the one you left back there at Calvary. It was me. And who loved you when no one else would? Who saved you when no one else could? If you have a copy of God's Word, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and stand in reverence and honor of God's Word, Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verse 1 through 5 this morning, Ephesians chapter 2 beginning with verse 1, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves 
in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Amen. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated.
this morning, I want to spend some time <clears throat> together with you thinking about the cross and the atonement on Christ's behalf for sinners. And next week, we're going to celebrate Good Friday, and then, of course, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. It's Easter, and there's so much that needs to be said and shared about the atonement and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf. <clears throat> You may ask, well, what is the atonement? What is the atonement? I want to give you a, a good definition of the atonement. It is the work of Christ. What is the work of, that Christ did in his life and death to earn our salvation? That's what the atonement is. The cross, Jesus' death, his resurrection from the dead, is the greatest events in human history. There's nothing any greater than those events, the cross, the resurrection. We're very aware of death. We've seen several in our own congregation in recent months die. All men die. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. All men will die, and their death is set by divine appointment. And I assure you, that's one appointment that you will keep, death. And after death comes either eternal life or eternal judgment. And since men are unable to atone for their own sins, God's judgment demands that they pay for their sins or have a substitute pay for them. Now man left to his own resources has no prospect but eternal judgment. But God. But God is loving and merciful and God had a plan to save man from judgment and from hell. God supplied a substitute who would satisfy his justice by taking punishment on himself and dying in the place of sinners. God sent Christ. And Christ humbled himself from his exalted throne and came to earth so that he could pay the penalty we owe. And Jesus wrapped his arms around us, satisfying his love by enabling us to escape God's wrath and satisfying His law and paying the penalty for our sins is the greatest story ever told. The wonder of it all, the substitutionary death of Christ is an essential truth of the Christian faith because without it, there's no gospel. Without it, there's no good news. You see, apart from his dying, we cannot escape the clutches of death and hell. It was a necessity that Jesus die and shed his blood upon the cross. <clears throat> but in order for us to see how glorious the cross is and how awesome it is and how wonderful it is, we need to see what we need to be saved from. We need to look at what do we need saving from. And this is so important. If you're going to understand the cross and you're going to see the glories of the cross, this is where we must begin. I want you to see number one on your outline, our problem. Our problem. We read it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. It's so clear in these verses, our problem is stated with such clarity. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. 
So Paul, writing here to the Ephesian church, states it so simply and so profoundly, our condition without Christ. He said, you were dead in your trespasses and in sin. The wages of sin is death. And because man is born in sin, death is in his future. Now, a man is not spiritually dead because he sins. He's spiritually dead because by nature he is sinful. There's a big difference. There was only one exception to this, and it was Jesus Christ. He was sinless. But every human being after Adam, after the fall of man, that was born after Adam and Eve, were born into this fallen condition of spiritual death. You see, man's problem is not with his environment. Society would have you believe that. It's like, well, the reason people are the way they are and they do such mean things and ugly things and bad things, it's the environment they're brought up in. It's where they live and what they're accustomed to. And that's what society would have you believe. But you see, man is in a state of rebellion against his creator. Man is alienated by sin. He is spiritually dead to all that God offers, including righteousness and peace and happiness and every good thing. Apart from God, men are spiritual zombies. They're the walking dead. They don't even know they're dead, but they're dead. And they may go through the motions and it looks like you say, well, they look alive to me. Well, physically they're alive, but spiritually toward God, they're dead. They're dead toward God. You see, before we were saved, we were like every other person who is separated from God. And that's what Paul is reminding the believers at Ephesus. He said, you were, you used to be, you were dead in trespasses and sins. The Greek construction here indicates the the sphere or realm in which something or someone exists. We were not dead because we had committed sin. We're dead because we are sin. And don't miss that. Because committing sinful acts does not make us sinners. So many people think this. It's like, well, when I commit sin, that makes me a sinner. No, friend, we commit sinful acts because we are sinners. Now that's the correct view. And by stating that we were all dead in trespasses and in sins, Paul was not describing two different kinds of wrongdoing. No, that's not what he's doing. He's not doing that, but he's referring to the breadth of our sinfulness. He says trespasses. That refers to stumbling or falling or going in the wrong direction. That's a trespass. And then he says sins. What is sins? Well, sin is missing the mark. It's like an archer that pulls back the bow and arrow to shoot the target. And what does he do? He misses the target. That's what sin is. It's missing the mark. Eventually the word was applied to missing or falling short of any standard. And so in the spiritual realm, it refers to falling short of God's standard of holiness. What does the Bible say? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what sin is. Sin is falling short of God's glory and falling short of God's glory is sin. You say, what does it mean? To bring glory to God. Well, you were created to love and serve and to glorify God and to honor Him and to live for Him. But what do we do? We don't live for Him. We don't love Him. We don't glorify Him. We live for ourselves. We follow our own way. We fail to do what God commands us to do. And Jesus stated His holy standard. He commands, He says, Be holy, for I am holy. That's God's standard. God didn't create a new standard for man. He's never had any other standard. Do you know what God demands of you? Perfect holiness. That's what God demands. 
You say, well, that's unattainable. It is in and of yourself. You see, we can't produce that holiness. And while we may be Christians now, formerly we thought and lived according to the world's standards, which is controlled by Satan and following his lead, sinful men and sinful women. You know what they do? They adopt the goals and values of a system intent on defying God and elevating themselves. That's what this world teaches us. You say, well, why is that? It's because the devil's in charge. He's the one running the place. He's the God of this world. And so what does he do? Well, the Bible said, what's the result of that? Well, the Bible says in verse 3 that they live in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now think about that. Now lust, that refers to strong desires of every sort. It's not just referring to like a sexual lust, but it could be lust for money, lust for power, the, the lust of our flesh. And the desires refers to strong willfulness, seeking after something with great diligence. Now, those terms are synonymously to represent fallen man's complete orientation to his own sinful way. Now, by nature, he's driven to fulfill the lust and the desires of the sinful flesh and of the mind. Completely selfish. Man, left to himself, is abandoned to do whatever feels good. It's like whatever you want to do, do it. That's sinful man. What is he doing? He's living in the lust of his flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Paul is writing, when he wrote to the Colossian believers, he described their condition as alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. That word alienated means being estranged or separated. And what he's telling the Colossian believers is before they were reconciled to God, they were estranged from God because of their sin. They were hostile in mind. They were hateful in mind. You see, sin is the root cause of man's alienation from God. And since God can't have fellowship with sin, sin must be dealt with before God and men can be reconciled. You say, well, I thought you was going to talk about the cross and talk about the atonement. I'm getting there. <laughs> but we got to see our problem. You want to see the glories of the cross? You want to see the glories of Jesus Christ and the atonement, you got to understand your problem. From God's holy perspective, wrath against sin must be appeased. It must be satisfied. Now notice that on your outline, and let's flesh this out a little bit more. Notice say, hey, all men are sinners. Now, we're born into sin. There's not been a man born into this world except the Lord Jesus Christ who is not a sinner, Adam and, and, he, and Eve were created by God and they were sinless, but they fell into sin and all men after that were sinners. Psalm 51 verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Job 15, 14. What is man that he should be clean? And he who is born of woman that he could be righteous. Not only are all men born sinners, but we deliberately choose to sin and rebel against our Creator and we willfully break His laws, we willfully reject His love. We are depraved in every aspect of our being. Your mind, your will, your emotions, every aspect of you is tainted by sin and affected by sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20 For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Romans 3, verse 10 and 11. 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become un unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one, pretty grim picture. And we quoted this verse a minute ago, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. Galatians 3.22 puts it pretty plain. It says that the scripture has confined all under sin. All under sin. But notice B, sin is what makes us offensive to God. Sin is what makes man offensive to God. Isaiah 59 verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, that He will not hear. You see, man as a sinner, God cannot love because sin repudiates God. God is so pure, He's so holy, He cannot bear impurity. That is His nature. God cannot look upon sin without hating that sin. It's contrary to His divine nature of holiness. And so God's anger burns like hot coals against sin. And that is what makes our sin so terrible to God and it should make it terrible to us because it is that sin that makes you an offense to a holy God. God can't look at it. We can't get to God and God can't get to us because of our sin. Our sin has separated us from God. His face is hid from us. He cannot hear us. He cannot look upon us. The bottom line, friend, is your sin makes you an offense to God. If you're here today and you're lost and undone and you've not repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are an offense to a holy, righteous God. And then C, sin demands punishment from God. Well, if all have sinned, then sin is what makes us an offense to God. Therefore, we are exposed to the wrath of Almighty God. And it's a just wrath. It's a deserved wrath. We are guilty as charged. Wherever there is sin, there must be a penalty. When wrong is committed, we demand punishment. Do we not in our own society If somebody breaks a law and they murder somebody or they commit a terrible crime, we go, we want justice for that. They need to pay for that. I mean, we all do it. But God will never allow His righteous law to be broken without punishment. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the soul that sins shall die. Romans 6, 23 The wages of sin is what? Romans 2, 9. Tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Where there is sin, there must be punishment. And friends, listen. I know we don't hear this a lot in our day, but there is a place called hell and it is a place where the worm does not die and the fire cannot be quenched, and it is reserved for unforgiven sinners. This makes sin a terrible evil because unless God vacates the throne of the universe, sin must be punished. It must. It has to. Every sinner will be vested with the punishment of God because it's the nature of God's holiness. He must punish sin. Now notice the last thing, D here. Sin shuts the door of hope on men. The guilty cannot dwell with God while they are guilty. They must be cleansed of sin before they can walk with God in heaven, into heaven nothing enters that defiles. And if you and I are not pardoned, if we're not forgiven, if something doesn't happen to our sin, then we will be damned forever. There is nothing that I can do while sin remains on on me to make me in right relation with God. Nothing in and of myself can bring that 
reconciliation. Something has to take place. Sin has to be put away. Sin, friend, listen. Sin is what lies across the road to heaven. It blocks the door by which we come to God. And unless that sin is dealt with, unless that sin is removed, man is lost and hopeless forever and ever and ever. There's a great problem. Have you ever been brought to the place where you learn this great lesson about your sin? Have you been made aware of the enormity of your own sinfulness? It is vast. It is great. It is what stands between you and a holy God and His wrath. Have you had sin go to bed with you and you you get up, it's still there? You can't shake it off? It blinds with gloom and darkness. Have you heard the terrible judgment of the Holy One ringing in your ears? Have you heard the the voice of God say, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You need not God to condemn you because you condemn yourself. I mean, have you come to a place where you realize that you deserve hell? That's what you deserve. Oh, the horror of sin, if you have felt its pain, it is the most horrible condition to be in, but we must be brought to that place of utter hopelessness and helplessness, and this is everybody's problem, and I'm telling you this problem that I'm telling you about today, it is huge, it is big. This is a big, big problem that man has. And apart from gracious reconciliation through Christ, every person by nature is the object of God's wrath, a victim of his eternal condemnation and judgment. Now, listen to me this morning. When we understand our problem and we see the enormity of it, it makes the cross and Jesus' substitutionary death so Precious and so wonderful. <laughs> but you got to see your need. You got to see your desperate condition this morning. So that's our problem. But let's look, number two, at our substitution. Our substitution. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, thank God for that. Man, we got a problem and it's huge. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You see, before you became a Christian, you stood with every other unbeliever under God's condemning hand, an enemy with seemingly no possibility of escape from his judgment. Your sin declared you guilty before God and there was no price that you could pay with your own hand that could cancel the debt, that could take away that sin. Oh no, you know what your description could be described as? Somebody with no hope. No hope. I had a pastor friend, he pastored New Hope, and I would call him every time and say, how's it going at No Hope? Because it was kind of a rough place. Does that describe you today? No hope. In Ephesians chapter 12, 2 verse 12, he said, Paul wrote, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel's and strangers from the covenant of promise, having what? No hope. And without God in the world. When you and I were our most desperate, when we could do nothing to save ourselves, these are some wonderful words, but God. But God. Well, let's look at the cause of the atonement. Notice A on your outline, the cause of the atonement. Well, our verse states it, but God who is rich in mercy because his great love with which he loved us. 
What caused Christ to come and die on that cross and give his life as a ransom? Well, I'll tell you the cause of it. It was the love of God. This is number one on your outline, the love of God. Because God loved us, he's provided a way for us to get right with him. Even though we sinned against him, through his rich mercy and great love, he offered forgiveness and reconciliation, and he does that to every single repentant sinner. God loved enough not only to forgive us, but to die for the very ones who had offended him. What did Paul write in Romans 5 and verse 6? For when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the good people. Is that what it says? He died for the ungodly. Since we were helpless to bring ourselves to God, what do you do? He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die in our stead, notwithstanding the fact that we were ungodly and we were totally unworthy of, to receive his love and grace. But John 3, 16 says it well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we were powerless to escape from sin and death, helpless against Satan's schemes and unable to please God in any way, he still sent his son to die on our behalf. And in that one act, he proved the wonders of his love. Compassionate love for those who don't deserve it. What Romans 9, 5, 8 say? But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That sort of selfish undeserving, selfless, not selfish, selfless, undeserving love is really beyond our limited comprehension. Yet the very love the just and holy God had toward us while we were still sinners, when we were in our hopeless state, in our sin, when we were ungodly and lost and undone and without hope, what did God do? God said, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to send my son to die in their stead. That's the cause of the atonement, the love of God. But the second cause for the, love, for the atonement is the justice of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 through 26. Listen to these verses. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Man, that's some awesome verses. Because on the cross, Jesus willingly took our sin and bore its penalty, God's justice must be satisfied. But because God is loving and God is merciful, you see, if he had not willingly took our sin and accepted it as punishment, we would have borne that punishment of sin in hell forever. You see, the cross is God's love in action. How can God be just and justify sinners. And that verse says that's exactly what he did. He did that through the Lord Jesus Christ. God can be just. His wrath can be satisfied and appeased. 1 Peter 2.24 says that Christ bore our sins in his own body on the tree. It was Christ himself who took on sin and bore its penalty, and he bore it willingly, voluntarily, and he bore it alone. The Bible said he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that term that Peter used, bore, that means to carry a massive heavy weight. And I'm going to tell you today, your sin was a massive heavy weight. All the sin that you ever committed in your life, that's a big weight. That's what sin is. But Jesus bore our sin 
by enduring the wrath of God. He was suspended on a cross of wood. And what Christ came to do on the cross, thank God, he actually did it. He did finish his work. When they sung today, it is finished. That's true. That's exactly what Jesus did. Christ did not die in vain, nor did he leave any of his work undone. Christ completed the redemption of his people by one stroke, coming here, living, and dying. He put away sin. He didn't merely try to do it. He actually did it. He accomplished the work for which God the Father sent him to do. But let's talk about B, the nature of the atonement. The nature of the atonement. Number one there on your outline, Christ suffered for us. Suffered for us. I want to flesh that out a little about what that means and what that looks like. Notice a little A there on your outline. Physical pain and death. Physical pain and death. And death. Now go to Mark 15, verse 24 and 25. The Bible said, When they crucified him, they divided his garment, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Listen, Jesus, when he died on the cross, there was physical suffering. They did nail nails through his hands. They did slap him and spit upon him and beat him and slap him. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. And there was physical suffering that Jesus went through. But greater than that physical suffering was B, the pain of bearing sin. The pain of bearing sin. Let's just let the scripture tell us about this. God's word. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has what? Laid on him the iniquity of us what? All. 1 Peter 2.24 Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. You see, Christ, the pain of bearing sin. But then notice, see, he was abandoned by God the Father. Mark 15, 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, God cannot sit in heaven to do this great work. You can truly say that he could not have saved us if he had kept his throne and not left the courts of glory. But Jesus did, thank God. Now listen to me carefully. Thank God he left the throne of glory. He was in eternity past, but he came first as a babe wrapped in Bethlehem. He was a babe wrapped in cloth, swaddling cloths like any other child. But however, this babe lying in this manger in Bethlehem's stall was mighty God. He was the everlasting Father. He was the Prince of Peace. And then God appeared in human form, made in the fashion of a man. He's taken upon himself our nature. The infinite is linked with an infant. The eternal wrapped in human flesh. He on whom all the worlds hang is hanging on a virgin's breast. The thought of that. He must become a man. He must identify with humanity. He must become one of us. And thank God he did. If he didn't, he couldn't deal with the enormity of your sin. But God came to dwell among sinful, wretched humanity. 
And years rolled on, and he toiled in obscurity in a little place called Nazareth as a carpenter with his dad and mom. Finally, John the Baptist comes on the scene to proclaim the event, advent of the Redeemer, and John himself, the servant, baptizes his Lord, and as he rises from the water, the Bible said heaven opened and a dove descended and rests upon him. And God the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And Christ was anointed there at that river Jordan for his public ministry. And he began at that time to make a robe of righteousness which would forever adorn you and me. Three more years rolled by of toil and suffering and he proved that he was who he claimed to be. He claimed, he proved that he was God. He healed the sick. He opened blinded eyes. He touched people with one word. He performed miracles. He raised the dead. He did what only God could do. He said, your sins be forgiven. Only God can do that, but he was God, so he could do that. He took a few loaves and a few fish and fed thousands. He calmed the storms on the sea. He did amazing things. He lived his life and he proved that he was who he claimed to be. But then at the end of his life, the great debt was to be paid. The bill would be presented. Would Jesus be there to meet it? The charge was laid. Would he be there to answer it? And you say, well, where would the Son of God be? He's out in the olive garden of Gethsemane, surrendering himself, and the night is chilly, and the moon is shining, and there the Son of God is in prayer, and never again will the earth hear such groans and cries. He's there wrestling with God, sweating as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. And the Bible said, his soul was sorrowful unto death, The sinner is called for. The sinner is called for. And the substitute prays in that garden on his face before his father. And he says, not my will, father, but your will be done. In a garden, man's first sin was committed. And in the garden, man's substitute was arrested there by the soldiers. And he goes through and he's condemned to death. And they take him and they scourge him and they pluck out his beard and they place a crown of thorns upon his head and they beat him and they lead him away to a place called Calvary, place of the skull. He travels up the way of suffering and there comes the darkest hour of all. Christ is there at Calvary's hill to atone for sins and they stretch him out and they nail him upon the cross and they lift him up suspended between heaven and earth and he's hanging there, the precious son of God. He's hanging there between two thieves. Thieves! And the sun hides its face as though unable to look upon the, the scene of sorrow. Darkness covers the land from 12 o'clock noon to 3 p.m. And the thunder claps and the lightning flashes. You say, why, David? Because the wrath of Almighty God, the anger of God, was burning hot against your sin and my sin. All iniquity, all unrighteousness, who is to bear them, Who will satisfy the demands of a holy, righteous God? Who will it be? On the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, presents himself. He hath not his face from the spitting or the shame. Do you see him this morning? Do you see him there on Calvary's hill? He's bleeding. He's dying. He's suffering. And then comes that divine desertion when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there God forsook his only begotten son and Jesus is hanging there on that cross. He's becoming sin. He's sin. 
bearing our sin, bearing the wrath of God the Father that you deserve, that I deserve. Oh, the thought of it, that God would die in my stead. There is the Creator dying for the creation suspended between heaven and earth. The great mediator. Listen to me this morning. There is one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a Savior we have this morning. He was visibly crucified among men. Observed by the gloating eyes of cruel men. He bore the wrath of God. He was our propitiation. You say, what does that word mean? It means a sacrifice that bears God's wrath and listen to me, turns that wrath into God's favor. Hallelujah! It turned God's wrath into God's favor. Because Jesus was our propitiation. I could not help but think of that great hymn we sing that Charles Wesley wrote. I was in my study and I was about to shout in there. It says, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursue. And then he burst out and he says, amazing love. It is. It's amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Oh, we sing amazing grace, but I'm telling you, it's amazing love. He bore the penalty inflicted by his father. Isaiah 53, verse 11 he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. God the Father, looking upon the Son, becoming sin, bearing the wrath of God, and it says, and he'll be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Not only was Jesus our propitiation, but he was our penal substitute. Our penal substitute. He bore a penalty and he died as a substitute. It was a vicarious atonement. What does that mean? You say, what do you mean, David, a vicarious atonement? A vicar is one who stands in the place of another. The atonement was a vicarious atonement. Now, I've mentioned some big words. Propitiation, penal substitution, vicarious atonement. But you see, they kill the precious, perfect, holy Son of God. And He did accomplish what He came to this earth to do. And He died. He died on that cross and they took Him down and they put Him in a tomb. But thank God, three days later He arose. God the Father raised him from the dead and that was the validation that what Jesus did on that cross was accepted by God the Father. It is finished, hallelujah. It is finished. Jesus has accomplished redemption. But notice the next thing. We have victory in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna tell you when Jesus died on that cross and he gave his life and he shed his blood and he rose again the third day, friend, he conquered the devil at that cross and all of the demons, they're a conquered bunch. You say, how do you know that? Colossians 2, verse 13 through 15. And you being dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespassing, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross, <laughs> having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, 
triumphing over them in it. That tells me that he absolutely conquered the devil and all the demons at the cross. Can I just say this morning as I close, Jesus is the greatest of the greatest. I just sit down and I just wrote down some things. I thought, how am I going to end this message? And I thought, this is how I'm going to do it. Jesus was obedient. He's the greatest of the great. He was obedient. He was meek and lowly. He was tempted. He was oppressed. He was despised. He was rejected. He was betrayed. He was condemned. He was reviled. He was scourged. He was mocked. He was wounded. He was bruised. He was stricken. He was smitten. He was crucified. He was forsaken. He is merciful and He is faithful. He is holy and He is harmless. He is undefiled and He is separate. He is perfect and He is glorious. He is my Savior. He is my hope. He is my brother. He is my portion. He is my helper. He is my physician. He is my healer. He's my refiner. He's my purifier. He's my rock. He's my shelter. He's my Lord. He's my master. He's my servant. He's my example. He's my teacher, and he's my shepherd. He's my keeper, and he's my feeder. He's my leader, and he's my restorer. He's my resting place. He's my meat and my drink. He's my friend who sticks closer than a brother. He is my Passover. He is my peace. He is my wisdom. He is my righteousness. He is my sanctification. He is my redemption. He is my salvation. He is my all in all. He is the greatest of the greater. Greatest. He cannot be contained. And I'm telling you today, he cannot be described with words adequately. Now let me tell you something. This is my Jesus. My question to you is this. Is he your Jesus? Is he your Jesus? This ought to thrill our hearts today. This ought to set this next week in its proper perspective as we lead up to next Sunday. But these words right here ought to thrill your heart. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. My question today is, do you know Him? Have you had your sins removed? Have you had your guilt removed? Have you had the condemnation removed? Friend, if you're here today and you're lost and you don't know Christ, you need help. You need Jesus' help. You need your sin to be taken away. And friend, if you don't, you're in trouble. But Jesus Christ has paid the price and he stands ready today to save the sinner. He stands ready to save you today if you'll only come and repent. Turn from your will and way. Turn to Christ. He's a wonderful Savior. He's a wonderful Savior. He's a wonderful Savior, isn't he? Praise his name. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of just spending a little time this morning thinking about the cross and thinking about the atonement. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for what you've accomplished on our behalf. You're such a wonderful Savior. God, I pray today that you would speak to every single person sitting in this sanctuary today. Lord, for those that are saved, they ought, their hearts ought to be so filled with joy and thankfulness and gratefulness for what you've done in their life. But Lord, if there's somebody here today and they're lost and they've not repented and they've not believed, oh God, show them their need, show them their problem and how they need you to take away that sin and guilt. Lord, we love you today and we just commit this time into your care. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's stand. As we sing, Jesus paid it all. If you